and I'm going to let all the participants in the waiting room join us. And feel free to begin. Thank you so much, Haley. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to this first webinar in a cycle of web webinars on climate change migration and health in Latin America and the Caribbean. I am Baltica Cavieses. I am an epidemiologist from the University of Development in Santiago de Chile and I'll be hosting this first uh, webinar. This webinar cycle will take place every two months, starting today on the 5th of March. We have, uh, we will be addressing a topic on this uh, emerging topic uh, of climate change, migration and health with a focus on Latin America and the Caribbean. This event will be held in, mostly in Spanish, and we have simultaneous interpretation into English. This uh, webinar cycle is brought to you by the G, by the Science Institute of Innovation in Medicine, uh, University of Development in Chile, together with the Global uh, Consortium of Climate health education from the from Columbia University in the United States and also Lanza Migration Latin America and the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research and also the Chilean Network of Research on Health and Migration, Regisat. Before we start, I'd like to give you some general information about how this webinar will work. First of all, thank you on behalf of all these organizations and all this team, thank you for registering and thank you for being here with us today participating in this webinar. You can uh, say hi in the chat or in the frequently asked questions. Please tell us your name, your affiliation and your country so that we can meet and start this conversation in the chat or in the Q&A uh, section in this webinar and in the future. Please remember that we have simultaneous interpretation into English. And to do that, please go to the bottom of the screen where you will see a globe icon. You click on that and you can choose the language you would like to listen to, English or Spanish, in this seminar and the future event and future events as well. We have expert panelists today with us, and we hope you really enjoy um, the session. If you have questions or comments, please include them in the Q&A section. We will be selecting some questions and we will be answering them in the Q&A session after the panelist presentations at the end. We'll try to answer as many uh, questions and comments as possible, but because of time constraints, we won't be able to address every uh, question. So please bear with us. Every question and comment that is not addressed will be addressed in the future and we'll try to uh, address them in future seminars. Everything you tell us or ask is important to us. I will be saying this again in English, uh, just for those who are speaking in English. And after this, everything will be in Spanish.
So how uh, did these seminars come about? Well, we aim to analyze and reflect on the re dynamic, complex and multi-level relationship between climate change, integrational migration and uh, the health of Latin America, people from Latin America and the Caribbean. We will be talking about the strong connection between the co-organizers of this event. And we will also invite you to reflect and debate on evidence and its exchange by uh, applying evidence-based knowledge based on our local knowledge of the region with real life experiences in the uh, diverse, heterogeneous and wonderful communities and countries that we have in Latin America and the Caribbean. This first webinar is entitled Climate Forces that Affect Health and the Well-Being of Children and Adolescents on the Move in Latin America and the Caribbean. This first webinar will describe updated evidence on climate change as a relevant force, but understudied force on the health and well-being of children and adolescents on the move in our region. Uh, we estimate that the number of children and migrating children and adolescents has increased in the last decade in Latin America and the Caribbean, in particular regarding the number of children and adolescents who migrate alone or are in, or somehow vulnerable. The risks, uh, the vulnerability risk and social vulnerabilities and health vulnerabilities these children and adolescents must face have been, uh, are now uh, globally and regionally acknowledged. But we need to focus on climate change in this regard. And this connection it has not been well debated. We aim to connect the local evidence in America, Latin America and the Caribbean in order to contribute to local and global debates in our region and our countries and communities regarding the importance of protecting children, especially children uh, on the move in the context of climate, climate change. First of all, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Alexandra Vachi. She's a social anthropologist, uh, has a PhD in social anthropology. She has a master's degree in gender studies. She has a PhD in social and cultural anthropology. She's the executive director of the Global Intercultural Center of the University of Development. She studies the behavior of differing human groups and their connection with health. She focuses on the study of intercultural Intercultural, interculturality, gender, and the identities in different social cultural contexts, including in health contexts. In the last few years, she has focused on adolescent health uh, and young people's health, especially uh, sexual reproductive health, including people on the move. Welcome, Alexandra, to this webinar. You have the floor uh, so that you can uh, start speaking. Thank you so much, Baltica. Good morning, everyone who is here today. As the executive director of the Global Intel Cultural Global Center, it's an honor for me to introduce, to welcome you from our research center. TESI is, re is an interdisciplinary uh, inter-school center hosted in the School of Medicine and School of Psychology of Universidad del Desarrollo in the city of Santiago de Chile. We aim to develop knowledge in priority areas that include different uh, health disciplines, medicine, nursing, etc., social sciences, and also other areas such as psychology and anthropology regarding some priority topics that focus on health uh, focused on Chile and in Latin America. We aim to provide excellent um, knowledge about the complexity of health globally in current modern societies and you know to create practical solutions to face the main challenges that Chile and Latin America are facing and we need to have to include theoretical and practical knowledge created in other parts of the world and we need to uh, provide our global south perspective uh, we um, study migrant 
the health of migrant people, refugees, also sexual and reproductive health, organized patients, and the well-being of children and adolescents. We face, we address all this from a global health perspective, uh, also from a, a social variety perspective, inequalities in health and social vulnerabilities in health. Also different health, uh, gender and sex uh, health systems and the well-being of children and adolescents. To face these challenges, to address these topics, our health center develops methodological strategies that include interdisciplinary, transnational research, implementation, science, and mixed research. We do academic work and we also, we have also, the center has also supported the creation of networks and associations in the area of intercultural health, including OSIFAN, which is a migration Chilean network. And it works with a collaboration network of um, researchers and professionals that focus on international health and health issues in order to do some sustained work over time with the aim to exchange knowledge, cooperate scientifically, and also the aim is to transfer research and evidence-based uh, experiences to take specific action, including a political agency interventions in health, monitoring inclusions, social and cultural equality, etc. Rechisan has over 80 members around Chile from different regions and different professionals. So we'd like to invite everyone invited in visiting our website, uh, salumigrantes.cl, in case you want to have a look at this huge challenge. Also, our CESI Center implements the interdisciplinary program that welcomes uh, migrants in Chile, PM. It is an old, uh, new alternative to uh, help migrants regarding the availability of health services to help these people integrate in our Chilean society within a framework of rights. Finally, since January 2024, our Global Intercultural Health Center has become a reference center for the uh, WHO. It is the only one of its kind in Latin America. So we are leaders and responsible for developing this type of uh, global health um, area in the region and globally. So we would like to start this seminar with uh, Columbia University. Other prestigious institu institutions have joined us, such as the IAI, Lancet Migration, and Lancet Migration Latin America, Migración y Salud, and Rechisam as well. Thank you to all our colleagues from each of these institutions. And once again, I would like to give the floor to our to the director of our SESTI Center, Baltica. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexandra, for these welcoming words, uh, because they highlight the importance of this cycle of webinars for this region and Chile. Now I would like to invite Dr. Anna Stewart Ibarra. She is the executive director of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, the IAI. In this role, Anna supports the member states of the IAI in their efforts to exchange scientific, uh, relevant scientific uh, data regarding global ch change to have a sustainable Latin America. She's an expert in climate and health in Latin America and the Caribbean. Her studies have focused on understanding the climate, environmental and social factors related to vector-borne diseases and other, other areas of human health in Latin America and the Caribbean. And it's an honor to have you here today. Thank you for supporting this uh, webinar cycle. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Baltica. Welcome everyone who is here participating uh, not just in Latin America, I see colleagues from around the world, and it's really a pleasure to be here with us, with you today. From the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, I would like to welcome you again. Our mission is to promote the production and use of uh, scientific knowledge on global change processes in order to inform decision making in our 19 member countries from the Americas. 
the priorities of our countries in right now our climate change and loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services and their intersection with health, poverty and inequality. The migration crisis that we see in Latin America then emerges in this context and it requires a TD approach with a focus on equity and social justice. Right now we are funding several research several TD research teams on big migration and global change in Latin America as a part of a global development forum call. In this sense, it's a pleasure to be part of these, this group of organizers. This is a very important course. It's the fifth one we've organized together with the GCCHE. And we have reached thousands of people with these courses that have been really impactful for capacity building and networking uh, in the region and globally. The last course we held in November last year was about El Nino and health. This information is uh, available for free on our website. Without further ado, I would like to welcome you, have a great webinar and hope you can meet each other and build the networks we need to address the challenges posed by migration and its impacts on society. Thank you so much, Baltica. Thank you, dear Anna. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to Cecilia Sorensen. She's a director of the GCCHE from Columbia University. She's an associate professor at emergency medicine at the Columbia Irving Center. She's an, she's an associate professor of environmental health sciences at the uh, Melman uh, Public School of Medicine. As a researcher and physician, she works on the connection between climate change and human health. She focuses on translating uh, her research into policies and clinical action in order to for uh, vulnerable communities to develop their resilience. Dear Cecilia, it's great to have you here today. Thank you so much for accepting this invitation uh, to support this cycle. It's an honor to have the GCCHE here with us today. Nothing would be possible without, without you. And this is a great space to learn together and to grow together. You have the floor, Cecilia. Thank you so much, Baltica. It's really wonderful to be here and I'm honored to welcome everyone here from around the Americas and around the world to this unique uh, webinar series. And I wanna give a huge thanks to all the partners who came together to make this webinar series possible. We know that because of climate change, we are facing unprecedented emerging health issues, such as the impacts of migration on health. And it really takes all of us to come together to share knowledge in order to build resilience among vulnerable patients and among vulnerable communities. And so thank you all for being here today, for dedicating your very valuable time to learning about this topic. I'm sure you will have many contributions to offer on your end as well. And we look forward to a lively discussion after we hear from our panelists today. The Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education was formed in 2017 to ensure that health professionals globally have the knowledge and skills to prepare for and prevent climate-related impacts on the patients and on the communities in which they serve. Membership to the Global Consortium is entirely free, and we invite you to join as an individual or as an academic institution or as an NGO organization. We will drop a link in the chat right now, and this will allow you to be able to keep up to speed with all the activities which we are offering um, through the consortium. So without further ado, I will turn the mic back over to Baltica and wonderful to see everybody and look forward to this learning journey with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Cecilia. And now we are going to go into our presentations. We have a researcher, Alejandra Carreño, who has a master's in ethnomedicine and a doctorate from the Siena University. She has been studying uh, suffering in migrant and indigenous populations, health and disease processes in different indigenous uh, health systems in Latin America. She has also researched gender, body categories, and life cycles. 
and their respective influence on the experience and, and care of health. In the last few years, she has especially been studying uh, prevention strategies in children uh, and considering motherhood and fatherhood in context of migration. Thank you for being with us. Alejandra, uh, you have a few minutes. I will let you know when you have two minutes of time so that you can close, um, begin to round up your presentation. Without further ado, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Baltica. Thank you, everyone who is in the room today. It's really exciting and overwhelming to see how much interest this has uh, arisen so that we can all address uh, collectively this phenomena that affects us all globally. Now I'm going to begin with my presentation. And now, so to set our presentation in context, I would like to address migration of children and adolescents in Latin America. In our continent, we, we seem to have a um, particularly large number of children present. They are 15% of the migrant population uh, worldwide, but in Latin America, it reaches 26%. So in our continent, uh, it's uh, especially, we have a, a migration that is especially young and um, consisting of children. So we have some specific traits. We have the Northern border in the US. It's a, uh, flowing, the, the fl migrate, migration flow goes north. And we also have the Darien Forest in the border between, um, in with Panama, that is taking a relevant role with the uh, migration flow that was um, increased when some borders closed due to COVID to, during the pandemic. We also have uh, Venezuela has especially been a source of migrants that have spread throughout the continent. It's also um, worth mentioning uh, what has happened in Haiti in the last few years, which has um, had a population that has moved uh, to, towards the southern corner and also towards the north. And we also have a significant number of migrants from Nicaragua. What do we know about the conditions um, that these children and adolescents are experiencing migrating? We know that there's a significant number of children in the specifically, uh, particularly dangerous borders. The, especially, for example, in the Darien Forest, we had 40, uh, around 250,000 people in 2022, 40,000 of which were children and adolescents. So we can also see uh, the number of detained children at the U.S. border has also increased. As for the migrants from Venezuela, it's estimated that 
all the Venezuelan migrants are under 18. We also know that um, Haitian migrants also comprise, uh, we, we have a large number of Haitians living abroad and of the deportations um, that were done uh, from in the US in 2022, there were 2,300 children and adolescents that were of Haitian parents, but they had, they had been born in Chile. So what do we know about the health of migrant children and adolescents? There is some evidence internationally of the issues that begin accumulating since childhood and that affect the, the present of, of these children, but also their future, because during this life cycle, the inequities that they are subjected to, even in utero, uh, will affect their conditions throughout the rest of their lives. And internationally, there's some consensus of uh, discussing this uh, as layers of inequity. We have access barriers to prevention, healthcare, and healthcare services that uh, then um, translate into an excess use of uh, emergency care. Also, we have issues with infectious diseases that have to do with social uh, determinants of health, such as tuberculosis and Chagas, that are more and more present in young migrant populations because they are subjected to barriers to access to this prevention uh, care. And so we have these determinants that have to do uh, especially with the poverty conditions that these people live in. We also have literature from the US uh, showing the effect of the exposure to pesticides and contaminants uh, leading to cancer in children, which is also connected to social determinants of health. Also, as for dental care, we see that uh, migrant children are lagging behind as well because they have less access to preventive care. And this also has to do with the changes in diet because the, when these children go from food insecurity to having access to high calorie and highly processed foods, such as the one that are available in their destination countries. Um, mental health is also an issue that shows up in, in literature often. We know that they are going through this at such a critical time in their lives for for the their development. So they're going through these transitions in borders, experiencing different kinds of violence, stress, also uh, some family relationships that are breaking or, or changing, exposure to xenophobia as well that affect them particularly. Sexual and reproductive health is an issue that is also not often um, made visible because we, we forget that that age group includes adolescents and many of the young people who are unaccompanied are adolescents. So the threats to sexual health also have to do with the criminal networks that uh, act in these borders and have to do with violence and sexual abuse, but also with the barriers to reproductive uh, health care, to contraception that could prevent um, pregnancies at this vulnerable population. We also have the emergence of respiratory analogies respiratory illnesses and allergies, living in camps, in irregular settlements, 
the children are exposed to to more to these factors and don't have access to any preventive care. The migration of children um, in Latin America and the Caribbean has multiple causes. There are many factors, uh, social political factors that um, cause these migration flows, different crises in different countries, and a combination of all of these factors such as poverty, inequality, organized crime, limited access to rights, etc. But all of these are also intertwined with climate change, which is um, something that goes well beyond the action of nature and is connected to the has to do with the political organizations that rule our world. So climate change on top of all of these is also causing conditions that will uh, make, uh, will act as a force um, that drives people away. So all of these factors that have to do with climate change, without a doubt, have an effect on creating new migrants and the conditions at which they're going to travel. It's also important to stress that climate change has increased internal displacements. And it's also important to consider internal displacements as part of climate migration, because Many times uh, we perhaps um, separate international migration from internal displacements, showing uh, how um, borders act as, as a theoretical force here. And it's kind of obtuse to separate that. We are seeing also an increase in internal displacements due to climate factors. And here we have a classification from the Internal Displacements Monitoring Center. And we see that in 2021, internal displacements caused by climate factors were even more uh, than those caused by violence or conflict. And so I took this photograph that is from a UNICEF report from 2022 that uh, sort of sums up very viscerally the effects of climate change on children. This is a picture of a child who is coming back to his community in Nicaragua after a hurricane has passed. And we can see the effects of climate change on our continent. We know that um, a lot of research and perhaps a, a research done by many of the people listening now show the vulnerability of our, of our continent to climate change with an obvious increase in temperatures, uh, a rise in sea levels, the Atlantic Ocean is rising um, the, uh, faster than other oceans worldwide, and this increases the pollution of fresh water. We know that um, hurricanes are becoming more frequent, affecting the islands in the Caribbean the most. And we also know that wildfires and droughts have increased 250,000% in South America. Uh, leading to a loss in biodiversity, among other issues. And so given this, we can say that the effects of the climate crisis are also affected by a crisis. Uh, it's also a crisis of the rights of children. And how do we arrive at this? Well, we know that children are more vulnerable physically and they are less have less ability to endure and survive things such as floods, droughts, and fires. We know that they're also physiologically more vulnerable to toxic uh, substances. 
associated to environmental pollution, such as lead, for example. And we know that they're not just going to experience those effects uh, in the present, but also in the future. We also know that they are at a higher risk of death from diseases uh, that are being made more severe by climate change, such as malaria and dengue. And they're also suffering the consequences of the deterioration of social health determinants, such as food insecurity, drinking water, etc. So what do we know about this? Well, it's important to stress that research of the effects of climate change on the health of children uh, is some, uh, still full of gaps. But there are some things that we have some evidence on about the effects uh, and its link to climate change and its effect on the health of children. We know the effects of food insecurity and how it increases childhood obesity. We know that when access to healthy foods is lower or reduced, then we uh, look for processed, more high calorie foods. And this happens especially with migrant populations. Um, also, when where wildfires have um, happened, we see an increase in children hospitalization, especially having to do with respiratory problems. This isn't just during the time when the fire is taking place, but it also happens uh, months and even years afterwards. We also have an increase in chronic disease caused by uh, environmental or connected to environmental factors such as having to do with toxic materials and pesticides that are present uh, where we have settlements or populations with children. And migrant children are living in these places and every time um, that the families have access to housing, uh, it's only in these kinds of places. We also have a record of the influence of high temperatures on um, maternal and child health, especially low birth weight and size and height. We also have evidence of the effects that droughts and the presence of hurricanes have especially caused in Latin American countries and how the, this has increased um, the flow of migrants towards the US. And this shows that the highest migration pressure is especially on the younger populations, both in internal displacements, rural or urban displacement and international migration. Here we have a brief summary of some reviews in the literature that you can read if you would like to. And in closing, I would like to show some results we have of some studies that we did in Chile with migrant children from our uh, who are in our country and with which we have also made the effort of bringing an inclusive perspective on climate change into our studies. Until very recently, our studies focused on international migration without considering climate change as a factor that is interconnected with political and economic and rights crisis that we are facing. So we need to establish a connection between the migration experience of, of families traveling with children and climate change effects in the region and also uh, in their origin and destination origins. These are the territories we focus on. Both 
uh, the uh, two studies, qualitative and ethnographic factors. The first study is still ongoing, and we have also included the voice of children. Therefore, we focus on uh, children and adolescents. And the second study is a complicated study uh, that has been um, um, assigned by the Ministry of the in Chile, and it will be available very soon. Results of both studies. We have collected information regarding the importance of food insecurity as a, a factor in migration, and also the eating transition that migrants must face, because in their, in their origin country, the, the, the children suffered food insecurity. And in Chile, they have access to a higher calorie, a more industrialized diet. These testimonies show us the opinion of children as caretakers and the opinion of health teams. Um, we can see cases of malnutrition uh, in children that are arrive in the country, also pregnant women, and the importance of food insecurity as, as, as a clear factor that uh, was included in this on, on this insecure and dangerous journey. Also, natural disasters affect the migration of children and adolescents towards Chile, especially children and adolescents from Haiti. Sorry, there's no sound. We seem to be having an unexpected connection issue with uh, our colleague. Just bear with me for a few seconds so that she can uh, join our meeting uh, again and resume her presentation. We're doing well with time, so we can take a few uh, minutes uh, so that she can rejoin us and complete her presentation. Thank you. So she is telling us that she has a connectivity issue um, at home. So let's wait for her. Well, actually, she had very little to go. Okay, so now we would like to give the opportunity to our two following speakers uh, so that they can uh, participate and so that we can give Alejandra some time to rejoin us. So now we'd like to give the floor to Dr. Manuela Orejuela Grim. She is an associate professor of epidemiology and pediatrics at the Medical Center of, the, of Columbia University. Her research as an environmental epidemiologist and oncologist focuses on uh, environmental impact during vulnerability times during childhood and adolescence, adolescence uh, development. She focuses on migrating Latin American adolescents as unaccompanied minors when they migrate to the United States. Uh, with uh, researchers from the Mexican Health Public Health National Institute, Dr. Ojuela participates in several studies that assess the intersection between the environment uh, diet and children's diet in Mexico. And she also co-leads co a multi-sectoral uh, team that evaluates food insecurity and eating habits of migrants that go through Mexico. Dear uh, doctor, it's great to have you here with us today. You have 10 minutes to participate. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Valtica, and it's an honor to have been invited. Thank you so much for this invitation. And thank you so much to Dr. Carreño for her comments and anthrop anthropologist from the Universidad del Desarrollo. She 
talked about her presentation. So it's important to consider climate change and climate conditions and how they impact families because they are forced to migrate. They need to, they cannot go back to their homes. And we, we know we also need to consider long-term consequences of this um, on the health of children. I would like to make a few remarks regarding the, the times during childhood where children are the most vulnerable and we need to include uh, climate factors. This might affect children that, um, that travel with adults and those that travel alone. And we should also consider what we call active transit, people on the move, because this involves some aspects which are essential and specific to this stage. Also, migrating children are not always healthy children. And we need to remember this in particular, because one of the reasons why um, a minority of families migrate um, is because they're, they're trying to get their children uh, a better health uh, treatment, for instance, because in their origin country, they, they have limited options. These children are particularly vulnerable. They might have chronic diseases. They might need to take some medication. So these children are less resilient and um, are even more vulnerable to uh, the difficult to difficult conditions where climate can actually affect their journey uh, while they are traveling to their desired destination. It's also important to consider that climate factors may include aspects that children haven't been exposed to before migrating. Dr. Carreño talked about uh, pesticides, for instance and contamination. Therefore, it's also important to consider this, especially regarding the path they're on when they are on the move. For instance, the exposure to pesticides or other um, fuels maybe might vary. And this might be a first time exposure and may, may cause respiratory problems, also allergies. And these children might need access to health services. Um, um, maybe they, they don't even know which health problems they have because it's something that, that, that they haven't had before. Also, this new experience, let's say, um, while they travel might lead to eating problems, not just because of food insecurity, because this is a major factor, of course, but also that might be... Uh, constant changes in water, in the water they drink, in the bacteria that might be harmful or not, but in any case, uh, it's different water. And also new or unknown food to children, especially younger children, and those who are adapting and those who are uh, starting to eat new foods. So, uh, the, the families uh, usually eat certain types of food, but, but now if they are on the move, move, they need to eat other things and they need to adapt to the eating habits of the countries they are migrating through. So food, water, water insecurity, and this also depends on the um, climate related factors on their journey. So this is not necessarily uh, um, dependent on natural disasters. It's just uh, unknown climate factors. It's also important to remember that unaccompanied uh, children or adolescents throughout adolescence, so between 10 and 19, according to the WHO. But we need to remember that we have uh, adolescents age between 14, 15 until the age of 19. They are vulnerable because of the policies in the countries they go through. These policies 
might lead them to more vulnerable situations on account of climate issues, storms, heat, etc. These adolescents would rather not take risks and they don't want to maybe stay in shelters because they don't want to be too, they don't want to be reported to the authorities. In particular, because some countries want to reunite families with good intentions, they want to reunite families. But some countries have active policies whereby children are sent to their families again without their consent or even if they don't want to. So they want to protect minors, yes, but this might have a secondary, uh, negative secondary effects, especially in the case of climate change scenarios or, or more vulnerability to climate extremes. Children might also migrate from areas where there are different vaccination schemes, they might be exposed to diseases they don't know how to protect themselves from. For instance, uh, dengue-like disease, they don't know how to protect themselves, they don't know which actions they must take. So these diseases are aggravated by climate change. And as I said before, especially unaccompanied adolescents are more exposed to higher risks because of the conditions um, that force them to migrate. We also need to remember that unaccompanied minors might be more vulnerable in situations where policies might seem to favor uh, migrating with minors. There's a, there is a danger of kidnapping, insecurity, maybe people want to go through more remote areas because of this, or more vulnerable areas. Children don't want to stay in shelters because they feel that they might be uh, uh, victims of, for instance, gender-based violence. Finally, we need to remember that uh, educational level and the emotional maturity of these children might affect their decision-making. And they might not be able to protect their own health. In the, uh, there might be floods, earthquakes, etc. Maybe they are not used to these natural disasters, they don't, so they, they don't know what they have to do to protect themselves and they might not be paying attention to mass media who might be using, uh, issuing warnings. Um, maybe they don't know what, what the warnings are. They might seem mature because they, they are migrating alone. They might be, seem independent, but they are still children, emotionally speaking. So they need our uh, support as a society and as a public health system. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela, for uh, the depth of your comment, for your scope, and for the number of examples you have shared with us. Uh, thank you so much. Now, let us give the floor to uh, some closing remarks by Dr. Carreño because she had some connectivity issues. So, dear Alejandra, you have two minutes so that you can complete your presentation. And then we'll go to the final comment and to the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Baltica. I'm so sorry I had an unexpected problem, but I was about to, to complete my presentation. I was talking about the impact of migration and climate change on the mental health of children and adolescents. Can you please set... Uh, the presentation mode. Yes, let's see if uh, I don't want to try again because this might cause some connectivity issues. Sorry, thank you. So this is all this also has to do with what Dr. Manuela has said regarding the psychological and emotional conditions of children and the experiences they go through during migration and also on their capacity to understand what's happening and to react. Finally, I don't want to have a problem. This is why I'm not showing the slide. We also have evidence regarding the effects of climate change on the living conditions of people and where people settle down, in particular families with children and adolescents. 
in particular informal settlements where they're more exposed to pesticides, contaminants, uh, allergens. And also my colleague talked about some factors that children or adolescents or families do, do not know how to handle, for instance, um, cold weather, viruses in other countries, etc. Um, finally, I would like to talk about the importance of considering climate change as one of the factors that interconnect with the migration of children and adolescents. Also, we need to understand that this is part of the inequalities that these people uh, must face. These are also impacted by climate change. It's an inequality and climate crisis. Health services and communities can actually get ready to be able to face the effects of these phenomena with resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandra, uh, for completing your presentation. I've received very positive feedback on your presentation. Thank you so much. Let us now go on to Mihai Lever. He's a physician, he's a medicine historian and anthropologist who trained in Germany in the University of Bonn uh, in uh, Spain, Oviedo. He has worked on tropical medicine and primary care in other areas in Germany. He has worked on He's a researcher and a teacher. In 2003, he started working in the Medicine History Institute at the University of Hessen. He has been a professor on migrations and global health since 2022. In his research, he focuses on the history and the current dynamics that have to do with social medicine and uh, human rights-based health approaches with a focus on Latin America. Since 2020, Dr. Nipper has been a focal point for global lands and migration and its Latin American uh, hub. Dear Miguel, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, well, you have 10 minutes to make a presentation or to comment on this. And also, uh, you might want to talk about lands and migration in Latin America as well. Thank you so much. Welcome. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Baltica. Thank you, Alejandra, Manuela, for these excellent presentations. I'm truly impressed by the quality of your work and also because you have clearly analyzed the situation, which is quite complex. And we've been talking about this for a long time. We'll be talking about the nexus between migration, climate change, and health, which is quite complex to teach. Um, but you have talked about very important uh, uh, action lines. Thank you, Baltica. Lands and Migration is an, uh, an initiative based on uh, health migration and health lancet. They published their report in 2018. And in 2020, we created regional hubs, one in Europe, but the first one was created in Latin America in Lima. It's an honor for me to collaborate with them. We have many colleagues from different countries and we are open to welcoming other colleagues from different countries. And if you're interested in this, please write to me or write to Baltica and we'll be very happy to uh, answer. Also, Isab Boisek in Mexico, Andres Cubillos in Bogota. They are the current coordinators of the hub. And also today I will be talking about something we usually discuss with them. Thank you, Carolina Batista and Carol Rojas, who have helped me understand the context of climate change, migration and health. And so now to sum up um, from my point of view, some of the points that were perhaps the most relevant from the previous presentations, and I would uh, like to add a few comments as well. Um, but thank you for the analysis. I agree a lot with what Alejandra uh, said, um, I think Manuela as well, that this is a climate crisis, but it is also a crisis of inequality. And we need to, to take this into account uh, every time we look at climate change and health. And also uh, perhaps a personal comment to what you have um, addition or comment to what you have said. It's unbearable the, the situation of what you have presented 
And I wonder, perhaps for me, the central question is, why are they in this situation? What responsibility do they have, these children, uh, uh, their, their future, their ability to have a good, a healthy life is so compromised by climate change in these different conditions of migration that is so, are so desperate. So this leads us to the concept of climate justice. It's um, something that we need to stress. These uh, children and their families are the victims of um, ways of life and, and of living condition, conditions in other countries, such as in my country, in Germany, but countries in Europe, in the US that have um, uh, created all of this carbon and emissions and caused climate change and now other people are paying. So there's the concept of justice that we need to bear in mind. We see this as well in, in the context of uh, migration caused by climate change, by droughts, by weather events and there's a study that I uh, appreciate Carol Rojas from Central America for giving me this that shows that the migration of rural populations that are leaving their land because it's no longer fertile. So their last resort to survive is to just voluntarily leave. They're being forced because there are no further resources or, or alternatives to live, to make a living where they are. So they mentioned um, in the previous presentations um, this active migration transit, but that means they're on the way. But we look at this in Latin America. In Europe, we have also a fence uh, to prevent migration from the south, but then what, uh, where the, do they arrive? Are they at a place? Do they reach a place that receives them, uh, that where children can have access to education, to play, to a healthy life? Who of all those people that leave the misery caused by climate change and other factors? We also know violence. Um, and violence uh, for land is also closely connected to climate change. So what are their perspectives, their outlook at the places they arrive to? There's no uh, definitive final destination where they're going to be at peace. We, for example, see migrants from Haiti who were, for example, living in Chile for a while. Now we find them at the Darien, uh, region because their conditions were not good enough and they're trying to go to travel north where conditions are also uncertain. So we, this is also connected to the mitigation actions and uh, for the consequences of climate change. For example, when there are droughts or when there are high temperature events. The ones that are affected the worst are the poorest populations uh, that cannot live in the safest areas in the city. They cannot invest in insurance for their houses. In 2019, the special rapporteur for the UN um, on extreme poverty and human rights said that there is going to be kind of like a climate apartheid, a tremendous inequality between the people who can defend against the, the conditions of climate change, who can migrate to safer places and those who cannot and are entirely exposed to the negative consequences and this is a, a justice and inequality issue uh, that we need to face. What makes, uh, or one of the reasons that I see that makes all of this so problematic and that we should 
uh, face from a human rights perspective would be to point that those who are the most responsible for climate change need to invest, need to be held accountable for the damage they have caused so that those who are suffering uh, won't suffer uh, those consequences as much. And that is one of the factors um, behind the the situation that makes it even worse is that both climate change and migration politically are not being addressed systematically. There's a huge gap between what we know, the evidence we have of climate change and the evidence that we have on how to prevent and reduce emissions of, of climate uh, active uh, gases and the measures and the political action in these countries that are causing these emissions. So we have a, a political action deficit in this area. And, we all, and this also happens on migration and health. We see, for example, in the US, uh, but throughout the, the Americas and in Europe, uh, migration policies are not considering the migrant people, but uh, it's um, more something uh, trying to control my immigration, not taking into account the rights of these people, um, making their situation worse. It's made worse by the lack of policy, by uh, climate change and lack of mitigate, mitigation actions. And so this is a vicious cycle, uh, a negative dynamic of, of vulnerabilities that are overlapping. And so people are, are suffering um, so much, which is ethically uh, unacceptable. And we need immediate action. So thank you, Angela, Manuela, for showing very clearly paths uh, for action. Alejandra said we have enough evidence. And yes, of course, we, we need more research. We can always research more. But in order to take action, we already know enough, both on climate change and health. We already know what we can do better as governments, as civil society. And in closing, something else is that we have caused uh, these uh, terrible vulnerabilities and these migrating populations are not just vulnerable but they're also full of knowledge energy resources and they need to be taken into account for example um, in the city of lima we have a group of shipios uh, who are living close close to the remark river under very vulnerable conditions, but they have made their life there and we need to collaborate with them to improve their conditions, not just move them by force, but work with them, um, not from a top down uh, thing to looking at them as a vulnerable population and, and they, that they have to do what we tell them from the outside as experts, but also always working in collaboration them with them, taking into account their desires, their experiences. And with that, I close and I'm very curious about what uh, discussions we can have. Thank you so much to the organizers of this webinar and the presenters and Baltica for moderating. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, for your presentation. And it's so nice how complimentary the different presentations were. One about the children and adolescents and their experiences migrating in a region. And then another one encouraging us to act with what we already know. And now we have a Q&A about this. We have tried to uh, re record most of the questions from the chat. And so I'm going to 
um, ask some of them to our presenters. If you want to, Alejandra, Manuela, Miguel, um, turn on your cameras. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so if the answers could be brief, as brief as possible. So first for you, Michael, uh, you since you closed last, you we have discussed um, mobility, the concept of um, migration and mobility for people who work, or perhaps do not work specifically dealing with migrations. Well, it's a it's a very complex um, issue, but. We have uh, populations that are mobile for many different reasons. Migration is when people move uh, to live in a different place under different conditions for at least several months. There are different criteria, but um, the fact is that humans, uh, since uh, our early on in our history, uh, we have had uh, transborder, um, we have had mobility, but this is only seen as an issue or a problem, uh, crossing borders and all of this uh, more recently. And so migration has different faces and different kinds. And so we briefly can say that, can say that the more voluntarily voluntary it is, the better, and the more forced it is, the, the worst. And so, for example, I want to um, highlight the, the situation of indigenous populations in Latin America. They, these populations are affected by climate change, and we are seeing internal migrations, but the context is a bit different because traditionally for them, mobility was a normal part of their economic and social life. And then the, the borders came and the property of land and companies and all of this uh, uh, removed the possibility of having a mobile life, which was what they had um, to survive in their environment. So uh, prevention, preventing the mobility for these indigenous populations is also a health issue. So we need to look specifically at what kind of population we're um, discussing. But sometimes um, migration is perceived as an issue. Uh, it's not an issue, it's a reality, but it needs to be handled politically, socially, and culturally so that it's not an issue for anyone. Thank you so much. It's a big question. There's a lot of literature with definitions about this that have also evolved with time. But thank you, yes, for reminding us that we have very diverse populations of experiences. And we see that all of these concepts evolve and are questioned over time. And so for Manuela, we were asked, how do historical factors such as discrimination and land property can affect the health of migrant children in the context of climate change. What do you think about this? Well, I think, I, could you please uh, read the, the question back? Yeah, sure, no problem. It's uh, how do historical factors such as uh, discrimination and land ownership can affect the health of children in the context of climate change. Well, I would say these two factors that lead to migration will affect children. Um, I'm trying to think of the the last comment that Michael made uh, to think of not just uh, vulnerabilities because for children, of course, the effects of discrimination can be especially harmful depending on, on their um, emotional development stage, but and the, the forced mobility due to the loss of, of land ownership also leads to 
uh, migration towards urban areas. And this has also harmful events and effects on children. But we could also think that this also opens doors and opportunities for children. And if we think of, of climate factors, we also have the responsibility of thinking of the opportunities that these open for children. Perhaps children could be um, subjected to less discrimination than their parents because they're migrating at an age uh, where they can get used to a different way of living. They're sometimes more resilient than older people. So I, I would like to keep thinking on this from uh, different perspectives with considering what Michael was saying uh, of thinking about it from that perspective. Yes, thank you so much. I think it's something that we should uh, continue to, to reflect on. These are big questions and they bring us to some specific angles, but always under the perspective of human rights. And we also have historical processes such as colonialism that, uh, that create all of this uh, between us. And Alessandra, the migration that is taking place due to climate change and political factors. It's of course due to the lack of adaptation issues for people in their place of origin. So what would be more appropriate and what, uh, how can we be sure that the place and the destination will not vanish in the future? Well, thank you so much, Baltica, because your question is an invitation to think of this transnational dimension of climate justice or adaptation measures or adaptation to climate change, depending on where we want to put the emphasis. And uh, the regions uh, where they come from, they can be affected uh, by climate change, but also the places they arrive to are also affected because we know climate change and migration are perhaps the the our phenomena uh, today that show us the the di globalization and the um, dimension of how these are all universal experiences right now, and so both for migration and climate change, we need to consider the transnational dimension. So to prepare um, healthcare teams, uh, health systems, interventions in communities, dealing with um, regard to their own territories, we need to have this both at the place of origin to avoid migration and the dramatic consequences of climate change, but also to better face the risks and exposures to pollutants and other risks that can be suffered when they arrive uh, at their destination. So uh, this discussion around climate justice needs to be a commitment made from all sides of the continent, well beyond um, the definition of, of countries and whether they have the, the financial resources to lead with this, to deal with this, we need to have solidarity to deal with this from all territories. Thank you so much, Alejandra. These are the questions and reflections that everyone who is here with us um, is wondering about. Show us how this is a multi-factor issue and how important it is to continue researching which is something many have mentioned. And Michael, I have another big question for you. So how much of migration is due to climate change? What do we know about that? Whatever you can say. That question is impossible to answer because it's very difficult uh, to really assess the effects of climate change on, on people's lives. Uh, things are so different. It's not just the people that must migrate 
because of floods and stuff like that. Uh, because some people have uh, uh, fled some climate change related issues. But many times th there are droughts and all that. And then uh, there are some companies that take the land. And uh, what is the climate change there and what is extractivism is difficult to tell. Therefore, we need to consider that climate change is now uh, making these reasons more serious. Now people have more reasons to, to leave their countries, but we cannot find a clear connection. This doesn't mean that we can say uh, climate ch uh, change uh, effects cannot be detected. Uh, we know very well that climate change together with biodiversity loss and e extractivism and inequality, all of this is a complex situation. It is like some toxic uh, uh, combination. And we need to analyze all this in order to act and help people with their problems. Um, they might be refugees or climate change displaced people or they might be the victims or of extractivism, but well, everything affects people. Thank you. Yes, people experience this at the same time. And you know, they, this experience, this in the flesh. And in the case, in this case, we're focusing on children and adolescents who are on the move. Thank you, Miguel. Alejandra. What do you think is the role of mass media when it comes to communicating these migrations? Have you noticed a change in the last few years on how people cover these news? These news? Thank you so much. It's a great question because it's essential, absolutely fundamental. Uh, it's very important to see how we communicate all this. We always say that the media and words create our realities. And nowadays, migration is communicated as a problem. However, uh, thanks to, uh, well, Miguel's definition, we know that migration is a historical uh, element that allows communities and humankind to develop. As anthropologists, we know that humans need mobility to develop as a species. However, current mass media have a, a crucial role because they tend to communicate the negative side of migration and they establish dangerous connections with crime networks and they also exaggerate this spontaneous reaction because people try to uh, tend to su suspect from other people. Uh, they suspect from uh, someone who behaves in a way, a way in which I don't understand. It's very important to media outlets to actually be committed to non-racist communication so that we can promote a more complex knowledge culture on migration so that these aspects are actually highlighted or how uh, migration comes about, being able to understand why people migrate and how the situation they migrated from is also connected, uh, it's also um, similar to situations we have in the destination country. For instance, in Chile, we've had a very serious uh, wildfire season and our nationals suffer from these fires, our populations, our children, they are the victims of fires. And this, um, we empathize with these people, but it's very difficult to be compassionate or empathize with the suffering of other peoples that migrate. And these, uh, this migration is narrated as dangerous by media outlets. Therefore, it's very important to have quality media outlets that are committed to this a uh, racism-free narrative that can actually um, face a challenge of this complex challenge of communicating all this, all these associations 
which we detect as academicians between climate change, um, political responsibility, and social and political responsibilities. We need to take actions as communities, as individuals in our daily life, and also regarding our communities. They have an essential role for sure. And there's still a long way to go when it comes to being committed uh, with between the academia, uh, media outlets, and also from the natural sciences and health sciences areas. Um, thank you so much. One more question, dear Manuela, uh, which is saying it's important. In Peru, we see that dengue is now affecting mainly children in some regions in the country. There are other, which other health uh, hazards do our Latin American children face? Uh, are there any data on this? Thank you. I think that we need to, are we talking about children in general in Latin America or is it migrating children? It's yes, it's migrating children. Okay. Um, I'm not sure we have data. I think that I would say that um, maybe my colleagues have more information about this uh, or about data. I feel that we lack data, especially on uh, irregular migrants, let's say, which is a, a, a high proportion of, of people. We need to assume then that they are more vulnerable. They are more vulnerable to diseases because they cannot fully protect themselves from these diseases. They have fewer rights to health in some countries. And that um, actually uh, worsens the their health issues. It's not just the health issues that people face in the destination countries. Uh, we all, they, all, they are also vulnerable because they are invisible in many senses. So uh, I don't want to speak uh, more because we don't have much time, but it's not an easy question to answer. Thank you so much, Manuela. It is clear that the complexity between the country of origin, its demographic and epidemiological profile, and the transit, which is part of the migration process and the destination country, all this entails different interconnections between different types of social, cultural, epidemiological profiles, etc. And this is also connected to the individual uh, risks including children, especially those children that, that are left behind because they don't know how to access the health system in the destination country. They might be afraid of being deported because of their irregular situation. Maybe they are alone. Um, thank you so much for your answer. Now, we would like to thank you in, in this remaining time. Thank you so much for being with us in, uh, in this seminar. It's the first webinar of several seminars we, have, we will have every two months. The next seminar uh, is on Tuesday, the 7th of Ma May, at the same time, same channel, same uh, registration process. We'll be talking about climate change and how it it changes the health of women in Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we'll meet again in two months time. Thank you so much.